Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Stars Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven, and I'm here with my special guest, Joanne Richards. And Joanne and I were discussing her husband, Mark, and, uh, you know, his personality sounds a little bit like Captain Kirk, um, Star Trek. <laughs> you know, he's always going against the grain, isn't he? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, goodness. But, you know, it, it's funny because I have this wonderful quote from a, a report that I have, and... Um, you know, I'm, I wasn't part of the military world or society or whatever, but their names back in the day were very well known for being involved with anything top secret. And what I loved about the Super Soldier Conference, the first one that we had a couple years ago, is number one, Max Spears came up to me and said, you know, I believe that your husband was one of the men who helped rescue us like as a three-year-old, a group of, you know, kids who had been, you know, they had been at some facility. Anyway, it's like, because I remember your husband as being one of our rescuers. It's like, oh, so, you know, mm. I naturally had to cry at that. And then Tyler Clark came up to me and said, you know, um, and Tyler Clark is like barely 30 and mm-hmm. our kids are older than that. And so, and obviously Mark's been out of the military for over 30 years. But Tyler said, oh, yeah, we all know about your husband. It's like, really? It's like, oh, yeah, we all know who he was or who he is, and he's the hero. It's like, oh, my gosh. Because, you know, Mark has a very healthy ego, but at the same time, um, you know, he, he kind of plays that down. Mm-hmm. But I'll come come back to him and say, I've been to this conference and stuff. So, oh, yeah, they know you. And he just smiles. It's like, oh, this is so cool. And what I love, you know, what I love about, well, one of the things, what I love about him is, yes, he's in prison, and he wears this funky-looking blue outfit, but when he walks into the room, he is a Navy captain. Mm-hmm. He, he, his head is half high, his chest is out, his shoulders are, you know, straight, and he's so not an inmate. I mean, he's an inmate, but, you know, he's so not <laughs> your typical Convict. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's another thing. So why did they set him up? I mean, what was he? So obviously he ticked somebody off to a point where they wanted to set him up and incarcerate him. Is that correct? I don't know all the details, but yes, um, he he can tick people off. He also he wanted to retire, and some people didn't want him to. Some people are would were afraid that because you know the new world order was really starting to come into power, and Mark and his dad and the men in the military like them would be fighting the New World Order today if it would be possible. Mm-hmm. The New World Order is, you know, having their heyday. Um, so they couldn't have Mark and his dad around. And for whatever reason, they decided not to kill Mark, even though they've tried many times. And I think there's even been a couple of attempts while he's been in prison. But he knows too much, and he knows where certain toys are hidden, and... You know, they don't want him dead. Mm-hmm. So it's better for them that he's in prison. Now, his dad, even though he was really ill, he was killed before he died. I mean, he, <laughs> before he died naturally, he was killed. We know he was killed. How was he um, killed? He was, his, Mark's dad was poisoned. We know that. Uh. Um, that's not what's on his death certificate, mm-hmm. but we know that. Um, wow. And... Uh, I, I will say that um, I'm a firm believer in contact with the spirit world. Mm-hmm. And Mark's dad has come to me many times and spoken to me through my medium friends and has given me wonderful messages of, you know, speak the truth, be brave. You're doing what you need to be doing right now. You're helping my son. And especially when I go to England, Mark's dad is always there with me. Except I think he must have been somewhere else this last time. I didn't have a lot of a lot of um, my usual support system <laughs> there. But but Mark's dad is always there. And two years ago when I went there, um, my medium friend who was with me, she said Mark's dad was right behind you when you were giving your talk with this whole like little ar- army of angels or spirits or whatever. Mm-hmm. They were just standing there protecting you and holding you up. It's like, oh, how cool is that? Um, 
Yeah, don't yeah. underestimate those legions. I tell you what, they exist in multiple realities. You know, that's one thing people forget sometimes. But I'm a firm believer yeah. in that also, that we are supported whether we see it or not. But, yeah, for certain. Yeah, and I usually do it before I give my talk. It very it grounds me. And the very first time I went to England, I know I'm off topic, but I'll get right back to it. Well, you're fine. Go ahead. The very first time I went to England, my very first public speech on any of this, I'm in a foreign country, thank goodness they speak English, but, um, you know, and I'm sitting there grounding myself, and it's like, oh, Mark is, like, right behind me. (laughs) It's like, oh, this is so cool. Um, And I either usually feel that his spirit is there watching over me, and all the elementals that come with me are there, so I feel very supportive, so that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Now, back to Mark. Um. So he's, he's pissed some people off. He wanted to retire. Certain people didn't want him to retire. And I think in those late 70s, early 80s, you know, he was involved with some things that really irritated some people. Um, and I don't know what they all were because he can't or won't tell me, and that's fine. I don't need to know quite everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a wife. I'm only a need-to-know basis. So... Um, so I don't know what it is that they felt he needed to be taken out of the picture and whether they set up the whole... There was a, a guy um, that was Mark's friend who Mark... One of Mark's cover businesses was like a remodeling business. So he'd remodel houses or, you know, add-on things for people. And um, and so he was doing like a, an add-on to this guy's house. Well, the guy had been Mark's friend for years. He was in Mark's wedding uh, Mark, the guy had an antique car restoring business and whatever. On the side, he was a drug dealer and a child pornography filmer, which Mark didn't really know until right before this guy died. Well, this guy died. Um, the kids who did it were working for Mark, said, oh, Mark masterminded the whole thing, and he was there telling the one kid, you know, kill him now, and then he helped us dump the body. Well, Mark wasn't there. Mark didn't plan it. I think Mark might have been off somewhere doing something as part of his job, not the construction job, um, but he he had nothing to do with this murder. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he was writing a science, series of science fiction books that talked about Marin County in the future, blah, 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 blah. And the kids said, oh, see this, you know, this book, he's trying to over, he's plotting to overtake Marin County. Well, to this day, now it's been over 30 years when when the co-defendant comes up for parole, the DA always makes sure that the news articles always say the Pendragon plot to take over Marin. It's like, okay, that was dropped from the whole case. It, you know, that wasn't what he was convicted of, um, but it still comes up, and the DA won't let it go. So my point is whether the New World Order was behind it from the very beginning or whether they saw their opportunity to get him out of their hair, they've used it. Because the military could not come forward and say, oh, you know, this is one of our stellar commanders, and he was working for us today or that day. Mm. Um, They couldn't do that because everything he did was top secret, and the military couldn't say, oh, by the way, he was doing this for us because now we have to admit to you that we were doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, they can't do that. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Advice when this happens. Um, And... (laughs) The, the other thing is we've we've learned that several of these boys that Mark had taken under his wing, and they're all juvenile delinquents, but they had various family ties, an uncle, a stepfather, whatever, that had ties to different New World Order factions. It's like, oh, hmm. so it not all in my imagination. <laughs> and Mark had made enemies of big corporate people who were tied in with the New World Order, and he'd made enemies of different people. And... You know, it, it's it's mm. plausible either way. Either they've just used it to their advantage or they plan the whole thing from the very beginning. I don't know. I'm just going with it's their way to keep him out of their hair because ultimately, however it totally happened, they're happy that he's out of their hair. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I do know from um, certain people who get targeted in whatever form or design or wh- however they're recruited, I do know if you don't comply or if you were, um, they'll try to re-educate you. If that doesn't work, um, they could take you out or put you in prison. I mean, they threaten that a lot. So that's that's part of their um, behavioral, whatever you want to call it. I, I just find them to be very strange units. You know, this is very interesting, but what, what did they use for evidence? Just the testimony of the kids? 
Yeah, it's totally circumstantial because there's no physical evidence that he was at the scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though he had worked on his own stuff and his own cars and probably had tools at this guy's garage, um, I'm not saying his fingerprints weren't anywhere, but I mean, like one of the one of the co-defendants like left a bloody handprint on a car that was sitting there. There was no physical evidence that my husband was at the scene of the crime. Mm-hmm. The kids used um, either my husband's boat or the motor from his boat to, you know, dump the body in the bay, even though they did a lousy job of it because the body came up mm-hmm. <laughs> and was floating when it was found. Um, so what, no cement? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> I said no cement, huh? No, no. They had a, they had a little motor from the belt, like a, a trolling motor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it didn't weigh the body down enough. Um, it's a big guy, you know. And was just it's very odd. It's all circumstantial. And I've read through the case, and his lawyer did a lousy job. The DA changed the date of death three times to make it be a day when Mark was probably in town. But the kid, there were like two main kids involve one did the actual killing and he's at the same prison right now as my husband only on a different area Hmm. Um, so they never interact but um the other kid who was like the main witness even though he supposedly wasn't there when the guy was killed he was there when the body was dumped um you know he he was the main witness and you know it's like well okay it's not all hearsay if he didn't see my husband telling this kid that killed the guy Mm -hmm. and um, he changed his story three times to make it work for the DA. I was like, right. oh, is that, is that, how can that be? <laughs> and I put holes in the case, you know, and they, they, um, uh, the, not the judge, the lawyer, who's a famous lawyer, um, but he was more civil, but, but he took on this criminal case. And he, because it was 1982, The town had just had a flood that winter. You know, the economy was bad. Everybody was cash flow poor. My husband had assets, lots, you know, he had lots of assets. They weren't necessarily in the United States or they weren't necessarily liquid. Mm -hmm. Um, So that his lawyer said, well, let's just say you're poor and you can't afford me as a lawyer so that the state will pay my services. Like, okay. But his parents had paid lots of money up to a, a certain point. And so, you know, when when the DA couldn't get enough evidence or prove, knew he couldn't prove that Mark's plan was to overthrow the county, then they dropped that and he took up the the charge. Well, he did it. The motivation was greed because they were going to sell these guys' cars, this guy's cars and all his tools and make all this money. Okay, no cars were sold. No tools were sold. Nothing was sold. Mm. Um, So... Yeah. And so now you're stuck with the defense because you've already said, well, he's poor. So it will not be dried in the DA's hand, but they'd already come up with that for the lawyer so he could get paid. But if he was supposed to hire all these expert witnesses to help my husband's case, he never did. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. It was just a lousy defense. Mm-hmm. And and that guy's still alive. He's in his 90s. He still practices law here. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> terrible. You know, it sounds like the witnesses were compromised without a doubt. Without a doubt. Oh, yeah. Uh, the witnesses were compromised. The the lawyers after that, you know, the appeals were denied. He's had several lawyers along the way take the money and run. His last lawyer, he had a lawyer when I met him who was trying to come up with a, a federal habeas and had all these points and swore he was working on things, took a lot of money from Mark. Mm. And, you know, when we fired him, I probably have one piece of paper that showed he was even working on anything, and it was just a list of ideas. It's like, excuse me? <laughs> but he got disbarred because he frauded many inmates for saying he was working on their cases, and then he wasn't. So, you know, we've had a really bad luck with lawyers. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know, take them with a grain of salt in general. I mean, honestly, the whole system's corrupt anyway. I mean, good luck even navigating through the system, as we all know. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's designed for the criminal, not for the innocent. There's... Yeah, no. It's like, don't you have a lawyer? I go, I don't have money for a lawyer. <laughs> well, they're counting on that. They're counting on people not being able to afford a lawyer or anybody a representation if you deal with it that way. And, you know, unfortunately, yeah. that's how long has he been in? You said 30 years? How, how long has he been there? Rested in 1982 okay. and was on, and 
and convicted and sentenced in 84, but he was only out on bail for a few months, like right when his trial was starting, and then it was re- his bail was revoked. So, um, so basically, uh, we're come come this July. What is that? Thirty-two years, Jiminy. That's a long time. Yeah, you think that because of his military background that they would incarcerate him in a military facility? No. Well, it wasn't a military crime, right? Yeah. And, and he hasn't broken any of his U.S. military oaths, mm-hmm. so they can't. If he did, they could pick him up out of there and throw him in a federal prison, and I'll oh. never see him again. Right? Yeah. yeah. Want that to happen? You know, he's he's written volumes, and you've seen my table with all my stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's just stuff that he is on the fringe, but he can legally talk about. Mm-hmm. There's so much more he can't, and he won't. So that's fine. You know, I've got plenty to share, and he keeps writing, so there's still plenty of stuff he can talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all good, but he's he's been there for 32 years, basically, and he's he'll be 61 in June. And he's old for prison, and the California prison system is very corrupt and very awful, and you know he has medical issues, and the medical care is awful, mm-hmm. and prisons are overcrowded, and the feds keep saying you have to release X amount of people, and they've just given the state two more years. They've already had like five to figure out how to release thousands of people, and they're not hardly doing it. Mm. But they want to just really, well, we'll just release the low-level offenders. And it's like, you're going to release the people who are going to go right back in. You should be releasing the old people mm. who are not healthy and who just have wanted to go home and see grandchildren. Right, and also <laughs> reevaluating the cases. But I can guarantee you the majority of people in there probably don't belong there to begin with. Right. That's true. I mean, That's very true. It's and pathetic. It is pathetic. And then you see, you know, I'm there practically every week, and it's like, okay, what is that 16-year-old doing in here? What is that 18-year-old doing in here? And it's like, you know, yeah, they did bad things. But it's like, but again, and like, this is a different tangent, but, you know, a lot of them, if they had been given some guidance or some education or some mentoring or whatever, you know, somebody to put their arm around and say, hey, let me take you on this better path, mm-hmm. half those kids wouldn't be in there. I agree with that. Yeah, they don't have any role models. And I mean, you know, television is not a role model for anybody. I mean, no, and like, they're not they're not getting rehabilitation in the prisons. Um, they're just not. They're the only thing there are a couple of prisons like San Quentin, for example, does have a community college program and some of the prisons still have some vocational programs. Most of them don't. Most of them don't even have arts programs. Some of them do. Now, we're at like a medium custody place, and on holidays, there's a nice little jazz band that comes out and plays, and that's a lot of fun um, mm-hmm. in the visiting. And But, I mean, back in the day, in his early prison days, Mark was teaching college-level classes to the inmates, hmm. you know, because he's got a PhD and a half. He can. <laughs> Right. You know, and then they would have a professor come in and talk your exam. So there was hope way back when. Now you're lucky if you can get in a class to get your GED. And they make it as hard as possible for these men and women to achieve parole because there's so few opportunities for them to have the programs they need that are required to be granted parole. Mm -hmm. Right. And he has, I mean, he has life without parole. Is that correct? He does have life without parole. Now, and the interesting thing is, when he was sentenced in the 80s, the the laws on the books were, after 12 or 15 years of good time, life without parole could be, their sentence could be reduced or changed to, like, 25 to life. Mm -hmm. And then you'd be eligible for parole. Well, Governor Wilson came along, and his administration repealed all of that retroactively. So now there's a few thousand people who are, should should have been coming up for parole long before now, and who certainly deserve it, most of them, you know, and have support structures on the outside. So it's not like you're just dropping them off at a bus stop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've, so, you know, who knows? Um, So my husband's not eligible for parole at this time. Now, a couple of things can happen. The feds, you know, if they would start enforcing, you need to release people, Mm -hmm. you know, that could force they might open up that opportunity. Well, let's look at these older guys, especially ones with health problems or the 60-year-old. You know, it's like, or, and if we would repeal 
the death penalty for, you know, that kind of stuff. And if they would, like, close down death row and make those guys life without, then the life withouts would become, like, 25 to life. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain things that could happen, but I'm not holding my breath. No, I wouldn't hold your breath, but yeah, but I mean, it'd be nice if, if they would reevaluate that case and uh, let them out. You know, that's just foolishness. And even when you think about it, all these criminals and, and the illusion of power and control that are far worse than anything anybody could ever do in prison that are wandering around without any repercussions. I mean, they, it's just infuriating when you think about it, <laughs> you know? It is. So it is. there's no and judgment. To get out, um, you know, the, the people who, there's so many people in there with drug problems, they need a rehab program. Mm -hmm. But there are also, you know, rapists and child molesters get out of prison. Mm -hmm. Well, statistics show they're going to go right back in because they're going to get caught again. Mark has been temporarily housed with rapists who couldn't wait to get out and go back. You know, those women asked for it. It's like, excuse me? And I can't wait to go back and do it again. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, crap. And that guy was getting out, like, you know, the next day or whatever. It's like, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really mentally disturbed people mm -hmm. who should be in a mental facility, not necessarily a prison, you know, and they were getting out. Or, or they're deaf, you know, on the other side of that. They're not getting the kind of care they need. And you have people with serious mental issues who are on heavy drugs mm -hmm. in the general population. It's like, oh, well, that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's another thing too, Joanne. Because we all know, I mean, there's the psychotronic stuff that that affects people psychologically, which gives them sort of a schizophrenic behavior, which isn't technically right. mental illness. And only those of us who understand covert technology would be able to assess that. Now, regular Joes and people who are in denial, especially you know people in, who psychology-based people, are always trying to mask that. Oh, take these drugs, and oh, this person's mentally ill. Well, I would like to go down a list. If I started really profiling targeted people or even people in prisons who have so, quote unquote mental illness, I bet you anything they've been hit with. Some kind of a program i would probably bet money on it you know oh, probably probably yeah. and you know it, it's sad because some of mark's room roommates have and i don't know whether their problems were because of their drug habit you know i don't know but they've had serious i mean they've been the best way to manage them was to keep them on you know psych meds and then the guys would just basically sleep all day mm -hmm. right you know, yeah. Because otherwise, when they're awake, they're driving you crazy. Well, the they're talking too much, or they're yeah. just you talk. But, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, right? Well, they do that with yeah. regular people on the street now. I mean, they're they're lulling them with whether it's a regular, um, you know, some kind of a contaminated water supply or whatever it is. I mean, people are getting yeah. medicated in one form or another daily. Regular people who are not in prison. So, you know, yeah. and they're getting lulled and they're getting complacent and and basically just sleeping. You know, they're sleepwalking from day to oh, day. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's one big agenda. And once again, you know, looking at all these different races that are occupying the earth and we share this world, obviously, with other species, whether we encounter them or not. Um, it's right. interesting to me now, obviously, they care enough about this world. I mean, they're here, too. So whatever happens insofar as earth changes go or, or sabotage, global sabotage, they, they obviously have some concern. And I wonder if they would step in or step up in support of, of repairing the world. What's your take on that? <laughs> Sorry. That, that's that's um, enough. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I'm going to preface what I'm going to say by telling you a little story about I have a lot of energy beings and elementals that live on the property here in and out of my house. Mm -hmm. And they're very delightful. Um, and before the show, my cat plunked himself down on a chair. He's right and he's back. I was sitting on this chair next to me. But he was looking into the next room like, okay, well, who's here? And I, you know... And then he looked to the other end of the room, and it's like, okay, I know you can see them better than I, and he just knows that they're here. And sometimes they just mess with him and, you know, chase him all over the place, but he's settled down now. But it's like before the show started, I was just saying, oh, come on in, you know, sit down. You can listen to the show now. I've got it on speakerphone. I usually don't, so now you can hear the whole show while I'm sitting here. But the, the other thing is, like the elementals, for example, you know, it's not just humans and it really irritates Mark when everybody assumes that any natural disaster is harp related because it's not. It can be, but it's usually it's not as often it's not harp as often as people want to blame it on harp. Aliens can manipulate the weather and natural forces. Elementals can manipulate the weather and natural forces. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, if we've pissed off aliens or elementals enough, well, they might think they need to take some action and they might need to have a heavy snowstorm or a really heavy rainstorm and cause some, you know, they don't want to damage the earth, but they might need to stir things up and either get people to wake up or to, you know, um, this sounds cruel, but get rid of a few people, perhaps. Or, you know, like, I don't know, but they, they have that ability. So it's not always harp. And it's not always the military. There are other natural things that can make these things happen. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, there's that saying, don't piss off the goddess, too, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Or> sometimes. <laughs> nudge, nudge, sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's people who, who practice the craft who can cause really nasty weather when you're that powerful. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, well, aware of that too. Yeah, and also the positives. But yeah, I I agree with you on that one. I would suspect the elementals and other beings, other life forms, get a little annoyed with with what's been happening to this world and the disrespect. And and I that's one of my pet peeves is uh, just the way mankind treats each other and animals and the earth. It's just uh, that's really a problem, you know. So I mean, I don't know what it's going to take to shake them out of that. I don't know if their mamas didn't raise them right or they're just being programmed by television. But I do know that people who are in our age group seem to be a lot more respectful to the earth. So right, take that right. for what it's worth. And what's wonderful is um, my grandchildren, you know, I've been teaching them about fairies now for several years. And it's like, and the, the youngest one, when we get on the phone, okay, Grandma, is it a fairy night? Because on certain moon phase nights or certain holidays or certain, you know, times of the year, we we put out treats and honor the fairies and the elementals and, you know, celebrate with them and give them, you know, a little treat to eat. Grandma, is it fairy night? You know, do I need to put something out? It's like, no, you know, or yes, or, you know, and you don't have to put out, they didn't eat it. I go, well, they're tiny. They don't need to eat a lot, or they don't eat a lot, you know, and I have more at my house than you do, and then when they're done eating, the deer and the squirrels come, so I put out a lot more than you do. Yeah, that's so cute, the spirit food. You know, there's something to be said about that. Um, You know, children should be taught magic and mysticism, you know, in a positive way for sure. Everything is magic. Uh, and I have this wonderful calendar, um, and I think it's, I forget which one it is, um, but it doesn't matter. But the, the saying for this month is, ultimately magic finds you if you let it. So I love that my, my grandchildren are open to this. And what's interesting is that um, other alien non-Earth species have their own elementals and come here with them. Mm. That's not an just an Earth thing. And it's like, oh, that's really cool, because the 1961 conference marked with that as a child, other species that came here had their elementals with them, and that was another way that the, the, the different species could communicate with each other their el- their elementals would translate for them. It's like, oh, how cool is that? That's <laughs> awesome. That's a great point you just made there. Because that yeah. makes so much sense, and I have never thought about that, quite honestly, Joanne. So I appreciate you mentioning that. And I know, like, in 61, uh, the, a lot of the grays were being used as translators. But then what's what's funny is, because um, Mark was there with his little English girlfriend, and they had their elementals, and then they met Naga's, two of Naga's children, these two cool raptor kids who had their elementals, and between the four of them, because the, the raptors didn't, the raptor children didn't speak a lot of English, and you know Mark didn't know raptor at that point. He does now, but um, but what was cool is their elementals were communicating. You know, they were communicating with the elementals, and they were kind of developing almost like their own little world. The four of them with their elementals, and you know, it's like they'd run off from the adults and hide and or do a little, you know, shift a little into another part of another dimension. <laughs> would freak the adults out. But <laughs> that's pretty cool. pretty cool. Yeah, it is. You know, it's interesting yeah. when you mentioned the other languages, how does the um, reptilian language sound? I mean, does it sound like a verbiage or does it sound like a tone or a click or? Ha. Huh. Um, it's it's very different. They It's a clicking, it's a, a very throaty, um, grunty, hissing when you're speaking raptor. And um, 
every now and then he will, you know, I'll just say, honey, say something to me and Raptor, and he will, and it's, it's really endearing. But the more elite of the Raptors, for example, will have operations on their voice box so they can speak human languages. Hmm. So, for example, when, when I first read about Prince Naga, you know, Mark had said, well, he can speak 16 human languages. Like, really? Oh, God, I can't even speak hardly two. I mean, I can you know, don't remember even much of my Spanish. So, you know, it's like, and Mark grew up learning very, in many languages, and his dad could speak many languages. And here here you've got a, a big lizard, and I lovingly call him that, but a big lizard who can speak English and many other German and all these other human languages and probably other alien languages as well. So, But not all of them can. Now, somebody lower on the totem pole, just a worker the raptor isn't allowed to do that. Um, but your higher-ups can do that. So they're vocal and opposed to telepathic? Pardon me? Are they vocal opposed to telepathic then? Yeah, it's vocal. Mm-hmm. But I think they probably also can communicate telepathically, but amongst themselves it's very vocal. And, you know, Mark, yeah, yeah it's it's very vocal. Because he, um, when he writes about Naga in different conversations and stuff, I can just picture Naga speaking. You know, and, and Naga's had humans, women in his harem and you know, they don't understand Raptor and they're not necessarily telepathic, so you know, mm. he would have been just talking to them. Right. That's really, really interesting. Well, you know, it, it sounds like his um, insurance policy is his information that's secured until he quote unquote transfers out now insofar as your husband goes. Now when that happens, um do you have access to his true information, the rest of the top secret information, or no? No. I only have access to what he's written and sent me. And, but he has, he told me early on, if something happens to him, it is somewhere and somebody will release it. I see. I don't have it at all. And I have no idea where it is. That's good. I mean, that protects you. So It does protect me. So, and, you know, he had that in place before he met me. Mm-hmm. So that that's cool. Yeah, well, I think that's really good. And, you know, it's unfortunate that all these cat and mouse games go on on this planet. I've never seen anything like it. You know, the more I look into stuff, the more bizarre it gets. I swear to God, it's like, I feel like throwing up my hands sometimes and just walking away. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's so much information here. that, And then there's so much deception across the globe. I mean, everything has become a lie. So it's kind of like, man, the more you know, the more weird it gets. Huh? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, it, it's pretty weird. And what's, what's fast, you know, he, he told me early on that, you know, I will make life interesting for you. And he reminds me of that when I get a little whiny about how, you know, crappy daily life is at certain point. You know, when the roof is leaking or, you know, when things like, that, you know, just normal family stuff happens. And, you know, it's like, well, you signed on for this. You knew what you were like. Oh, I didn't really know what I was getting into. This is not what you told me on our first date. You never said UFOs and aliens. And, but, but yeah, it's been very interesting. And he has opened my world up into a whole nother arena, obviously, than anything I had ever been exposed to. Thankfully, because my eyes are open and I don't look at things the same way anymore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of magic that has come into my life and a lot of wonderful things. And I've learned how to be intuitive. I've learned how to believe in things and believe in manifesting things. And, you know, just lots of good things have happened. And I've learned all this incredibly wonderful, odd, weird history yeah, it's, <laughs> that it's I love really- sharing. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, and I'm yeah, I appreciate everything that you're offering tonight. And so far as the information goes, I really have a lot of respect for that. And Steve Travesty called in, and uh, he's a special call. I gave him a green light to call in, Ooh. and I know he had a, a few questions for you. Steve is also a producer and, and, a, and a host here at Revolution Radio. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Hey, Steve, how's it how's it going? Hey, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, I wanted to know. You spoke earlier on in the show about these uh, about these uh, these treaties. Uh, the specifically the disclosure based treaties, and I, I wanted to know: Do you have enough current events insight to talk about, um, you know, when the next negotiation for for treaties is is going to happen? Just so we can potentially. Well, let me say, um, 
conference won in 1961. There was the next big conference was 1971. And then in the 80s, and the, there wasn't one like in 81 because of the Falklands War. And there was smaller ones like Kyoto and things like that. The next big one was 2011 after the Royal Wedding. So there might be small ones along the way. You know, they typically are every 10 years the big ones. Mm. That's about all I know. Do those do those uh, treaties have contingencies, or are they just simply set for a period of time? Well, those conferences are every 10 years. Now, like, um, uh, the, the the part of the treaty that I know, like the, the ban on open communication with civilians and aliens, that was in place for 50 years, and then it's been re, re-upped for another 25 other other parts like there was like in sixty one there was like this one umbrella treaty. Um, I don't know how long that was supposed to last. And then you know there's always been along the way other treaties that have been made outside of these conferences. So like you know there's treaties that govern what goes on in the southern oceans. That's why we don't go there. There's treaties that you know that earlier presidents have made, and treaties get broken. And sometimes governments make side deals with, you know, side groups of aliens. So you know, that's a whole other story. So I'd, I'd have to ask the captain what the time limit is on, you know, the major treaties, because I don't know. But they're usually, you know, supposed to last quite a while, I would imagine. Mm, mm. Well, like the contingencies that I mean, like, like I can, uh, I can respect that, like, you know, you go for a period of time, but often, you know, a treaty will have certain kinds of language in which it makes the treaty null and void. Like, you know, uh-huh. say like, you know, like this treaty is valid unless, uh, this particular kind of war were to be declared and thus these terms would go into effect instead. That's what I mean by contingencies, anything uh-huh. like that, you know, I'll have to ask him because um, and and the first time I gave the talk about the England thing, I didn't have the full report. Now I have it, and that second half goes more into probably the details of that 1961 treaty. So that's something I will be reading and scanning and starting to talk about. And, you know, just now he's still writing about the Iran conference. So I don't even know what that treaty was, but I will ask him because I do see him every week. So I'll ask him if there, you know, there there must be, you know, if this happens, you know, what you're saying. So I'm going to ask him what makes them null and void. Mm-hmm. Thank you okay. so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Hey, thanks for calling in. I appreciate you calling in. Also, thanks for covering for me when I was disconnected. Any so, any time, so <laughs> Take care. Take care. Hi. So, Solaris, can I plug the conference? I'm going to. Oh, do absolutely. Yes. Anything you want, go for it. Okay. Well, you already gave my website, which is edhca.org for Earth Defense Headquarters. And then I'm speaking at a conference in Las Vegas the last weekend of March, March 28th through 30th. It's called The Awakening, the Number Four Real Encounters International. It's to be held at the Ultraviolet Theater on Russell Road or Avenue in Las Vegas. Um Jerry Dean is the the organizer. It's on Facebook and on Eventbrite. I don't think there's a a working website because I think somebody hacked it. Mm. The ticket price seems very reasonable. Uh, For a while, it was like, you know, $90 or $100 for the whole weekend, something like that. Um, So the price seems very reasonable. There's four or five speakers each day. I don't know which day I'm speaking, but I'm giving a talk on the different alien species. So I have a, like a whole hour talk on different species that my husband or the military, and it's usually the ones he's come in contact with um, that he's been writing about, you know, what they're like, what they look like, where they're from, what their families are like, what their social structure is like, what their agenda is, you know, why they're here, that kind of stuff. So that's, I've given it a couple times now in England and at the UFO conference here in San Jose, and it's gone over very well. So I'm going to give it again. Nice. And I have pictures <laughs> of different aliens. So uh, anyway, so if you can go, I would look it up on Facebook or Eventbrite, and please come. I don't know how many tickets have been sold yet, but I'm sure we've got room for more. So 
Excellent. Come if you can. It should be fun. Oh, yeah. That's fabulous. And, of course, you'll be at the next Super Soldier Summit as well. I will, and that's the end of June. It's the end of May, right? Like the oh, last yeah, I'm sorry. Of May. Yeah, but it, but it does go into June. June, yeah. So we'll see each other the there. Like Pardon May, me? June. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, I suggest uh, if you haven't checked out Joanne's information, please do, and also your website, too, and all the information that's available on there. And, and if they want to get a hold of you and contact you for any reason, uh, that would be what, on the website or Facebook or how? Well, you can – I have I have the website, and my email is on the website and my phone number. Um, if you – Type in my name, and there's no E in Joanne, J-O space capital A-N-N Richards. If you type me in for Facebook, my regular page comes up, and then I have a side page for Earth Defense Headquarters. So that's there. On YouTube, the different radio shows I've been on, they've posted my interviews. That I have, I haven't done anything on YouTube, but there's a lot of stuff that you know, I've done that's on there. Right. Um, my the interview with Carrie Cassidy is either on her site or on YouTube. That also, just this past November, she came to the prison with me and interviewed Mark herself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I saw that. Video blog afterwards, you know, um, of what she remembered that they talked about. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I actually checked that out. Very good information there, and uh, that's great that she was able to get in, huh? And, well, and she, you know, she didn't wasn't allowed to take notes because I didn't get her cleared as a media person. I said, just come and meet him, you know. Make see for yourself that he's a real person and he's speaking the truth. And they had a really good, and it, you know, you only got a couple of hours, so it was fast and furious. And she's hoping to come back soon. Right. And I'm trying to get her cleared as a media person so she can at least take notes. Mm-hmm. She's not going to be able to videotape him or record him, but at least, you know, media people should be allowed to take notes. So That's we're working awesome. on that. Yeah, no, that'd be great if you can do that. So, yeah, I'll be looking forward to that. And, and hopefully, maybe, you know, they'll. We'll get it in gear and get him out of there, really. That would be really nice because, you know, we'd like to retire together someday. And, you know, he's got grandkids to see. And, mm-hmm. you know, he hasn't seen his kids for a million years. And, you know, he's missing out on a lot. Yeah, you know what it is? It's a waste of time and the illusion of time. It's just so many mo- moments are wasted away by by such scattered information or, or the way uh, dysfunctional government runs. I mean, when I think about you know, living from day to day in the the backwards energy. I mean, everything is like a psychic drain. So, right. I mean, you know, it's just ridiculous. I mean, my goodness. I don't think anything ain't like it. You know, I just observe it and I'm like, ugh. <laughs> it just gets weird and after a while. I, I love my bookkeeping business, which pays all my bills. And, you know, I love that. Um, I love being a bean counter. But I really love also this whole other side of my life that I'm involved with and sharing mm-hmm. and it, you know, it's cool. Mark and I, you know, we we don't limit ourselves to thinking he'll be there the rest of his life. You know, we were just a couple of weeks ago. It was like, well, when I get out, you know, why don't we start a little shop? You know, we'll have, you know, we'll have cool, like a little gift shop and, you know, witchy stuff and fairy stuff and dragon stuff and E.T. stuff and UFOs. Like, okay, yeah, sure. Why not? Sounds good <laughs> you know, to me. So we, we dream and envision him being home and... Mm-hmm. You know, retiring with me and having our grandkids around or being able to go visit the grandkids. And, you know, we, we don't limit ourselves to thinking, you know, he's going to be there forever because that would be totally depressing. <laughs> I think that's a real positive uh, way to look at things. And also, you never know. I mean, you can you can contact the right person and it might turn around. So I think holding the vision for that and running the energy for that is a, is a really good thing. Right. Not a doubt. And you, you have... Um, oh, go ahead. Of, especially in England, I've got... I'm, I love England. I've got lots of friends there, but, um, you know, they keep saying, you know, I just, I see him, I sense him coming home and, you know, and sometimes they're a lot more positive about it than I am because I live with the day to day of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no, just, you know, keep envisioning him coming home, you know, that miracles happen. It's like, okay, okay, okay. Exactly. You're very so strong much. too, Joanne. I must, I must give you a lot of credit for being as strong as you are because you've held up yeah. quite well. And uh, that shows, I mean, that energetic, whatever your spiritual design is, it's very fortified. And, and then you need to be fortified in situations like this. I mean, you just have to step up. But I think a lot of the time when we do that, our higher self oversoul descends in and it fortifies yeah. us more so. So, yeah, I see that in you for sure. And I, I applaud you for everything you've been doing. And I know it's been painful. I'm sure it's, uh, it's horrific. Yeah. I mean, anytime that, that things like that happen in people's lives, you know. 
And I've been with him now more than half of that time. We've been together 16 and a half years. So I've been with him longer, you know, more than half of his time in prison. So it's been a long haul. And when I met him, he had a lawyer. He thought he was going to get out in a couple of years. Oh, cool. I can wait two years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Honey, it's been over 16 now. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I'm going to get you out of there. Right. You know, but at the same time, like I said, I'm fortified by the elementals that are around me. His dad comes in, you know, and I've got great friends, whether it's here in the States or in England. You know, I just had an email today from a guy in Ireland, and, you know, I get emails from people in England. And I've had, especially after I was on Carrie's Cassidy's show, people have been emailing me from all over the world every now and then. Oh, I, I listen to that show. So, so the support comes, and then, mm-hmm. you know, it buoys me up, and that's that's gratifying. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's a big network when you think about it. And what I like about it is you don't know what these people really, quote, unquote, look like. or But you do know that there's a vibrational, um, kind of like a, a, a resonance of some kind between people that are right. understanding this language. And I think that's really important. And I think that the word that we're communicating and the things that we're doing right now in this timeline is, is having an effect on a positive yeah. level. So, I mean, I encourage you to keep going with the information. And I know it sounds out there. Believe me, I know a lot of stuff sounds out there. And had I not, you know, gotten into covert technology the way I did, I would have never believed any of it. But I know I it's know. real. And, um, you know, it's it's science 101. And then everything else opens the door to other, other levels of consciousness and dimensions. And we all know there are other species. So, you know, just do the math, right? Well, and it's like, you know, I always bring it back to my grandchildren because the simplest things, it's like, well, Grandma, they don't believe in fairies. I go, well, that's okay, you know, but you and I know they're real. It's okay. And um, it, it was really funny because I, I something came up at Christmas and I was bringing up witchcraft. Well, Grandma, it's like, well, you know, being a witch is, is just, you know, you love nature, you love herbs, you love the fairies. Oh, well, I'm a, you know. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I go, this isn't a bad thing. It's not black mat. You know, it, it's wonderful. You know, it's just, it just, you put it down on their level and they get it. Right. Yeah. You know, it's how it's addressed. Okay. Yeah. You know, I see that so much, you know, with, with witches, they assume that we're all, you know, I don't know what, but I think it has a lot to do with Hollywood, quite honestly. And, you know, I know. Well, what- and, and really, you know, when you boil it all down, the magic a lot of the magic they've learned and grown up with, I mean, it's all science. Mm-hmm. We just don't understand it. And a lot of their science and magic, they've gotten from aliens. Oh, I, yeah, I agree with that. And several of the the women who practice the craft that I know or know about um, have consulted with raptor witches and things and high priestesses from other species like, how cool is that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've met some interesting witches, too, that are I would consider to be more than hybrids. Yeah, no, I, I believe that, too. I think that they're... And you know what? Also, when you start tapping into these different frequencies and vibrations, we all alter our DNA. So that's, that's highly possible that they're able to shapeshift into something that's part of their ancestry. It's not even, you know, it's not even shapeshifting. It's like, you know, here's a human witch. She's talking face-to-face with a raptor witch. It's just, it's that simple. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, this come to visit Earth for whatever reason, and, you know, she's talking to the local, you know, witch, and that's so cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's like, but when I go to these conferences sometimes, you know, sometimes, and I'm sure you've had this feeling, I'll meet somebody, and as soon as I shake their hand or whatever or get within inches, I'm crying, and you get that feeling. It's like, oh, my God, it was meant for me to meet you, and I know you on a different level, and this is so cool. <laughs> Exactly. And you just, this instant bond, and, you know, oh, it's a whole energy thing, and I love it. Yeah, I do, too. It's it's a soul resonance thing, without a doubt, and I've had that happen in the past. But, yeah, and that's very unique because nowadays people are so um, scrambled with their energy fields that, you know, when you right. do encounter those people, those that, whatever souls they are, it's uh, it's a sacred moment, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah, and there. it's, well, I know we're probably almost out of time, aren't we? We have about 10 minutes. We're good. Okay. Go ahead. Good. Because, um, like, when I was in England this last time, I got to go to Glastonbury. Usually when I'm in England, part of my trip is speaking, and then part of it is exploring places Mark has written about and whatever. And I still, you know, I did a lot of it on the last trip. But, like, the next to the last day, you know, I said, I was in southern England. I said, I have to go to Glastonbury. I was like, oh, my gosh, I loved it. And I, I, I looked up at the tour, and I thought, oh, crap, I can't climb that. I'm just going to die. 
And my friend and her friend that we were with, you know, we're just walking up this street. And I go, I'm not climbing up that thing. He goes, no, we'll just walk up this hill and then we'll go down the other side. It's like, okay. Well, the next thing I know, he's got me walking up the side of the hill <laughs> because that's where the path going down was. <laughs> and I've climbed the Glastonbury Tor, which you look at it and it looks like just the ruin of an old church that King Henry VIII destroyed. It's like, but when you stand on the vortex and this one, when you stand on the top of that hill, and especially if you stand on the magic spot, and it's like, oh, it it was incredible. Mm-hmm. And that was, I so, said, well, I can, I can, I, can, I don't want to say I can die now. It's like, this is like the highlight of my trip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh yeah. You know, it was like just like meeting a special person whenever I go to certain of these things. It's like that was so cool and so gratifying. And then of course I turn around and there's this guy in black. It's like, oh, I, I can't. I have to go now because <laughs> he he's not here for a nice reason. Well, I got to go now. But oh, it funny. was just so wonderful to have that kind of experience. Wow, no yes. kidding. And so the guy in black, was he kind of like just a shadow person, uh, MIB type? Well, and before I, it was funny though, because here's this group of school children who've climbed the tour and they're learning about the history. And then there's over, here's this guy explaining to people about the ley lines that cross the tour and stuff. And so I go, okay, I'm just putting my arms out and I'm going to pull in the energy of this tour. And it was, well, I don't care who sees me. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, this is pretty, Joanne. This isn't like you. <laughs> Um, this guy, I don't know. Um, it's kind of like the the people that show up at conferences who you know are just there to check on you. He was mm-hmm. very nice looking, I don't, probably my age. He had dressed all in black, like black jeans, black T-shirt, had a camera, pretending like he was a tourist. But I just knew in my gut, okay, he's here to check on me. He didn't. He didn't walk up to me. He just kept watching in my direction. It's like okay, he's not here to enjoy the tour or the scenery. Mm-hmm. And I just went with my guys, like, okay, got to go now. And we, it's like, I got to go downhill. <laughs> and we did, you know, we were done anyway, but it's like, you know, I just knew that we had to get off of there. How funny it's is that? It's not like he didn't follow me or anything, but you, know, you just get impressions and you have to follow them. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do. And some of them are not necessarily negative. Like, like you mentioned before, I mean, I know that there are a few that probably watch our backs opposed to really being a negative. So at least in right. the past, my my personal experience, I can tell you that there have been some that are ominous in presence, but have not been bad, have been more like right. guardians, you know, watchers, so to speak. But yeah, that's pretty interesting. But I'll tell you what, it's been incredible to have you on tonight, Joanna, and I hope to have you back because it's phenomenal talking to you. And there's so many levels we can go to um, with this information. So I just want to thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I can't yeah. wait to see you all day. Yeah, me either. I'll get to see you again. And also, yeah. um, once again, let's give everybody your information, your website before you um, before we get out of Earth Defense Headquarters, so it's E-D-H-C-A for Earth Defense Headquarters, California.org. And, uh, you know, visit the site. I've got lots of reports. I've got an extra flyer that I send out to people that describes all the reports. I'm getting that part on my website. But anyway, lots of reports. Mark is always writing more. There's just the history just keeps coming and there's so much to learn and I hope he doesn't stop sharing it, but, um, you know, I agree. I don't think that will help information out here and, and have, you know, a little payback. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I do want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight here at revolution radio and, uh, and thank you, Steve Travesty and, uh, for calling in with some really good questions there. Also, please join me next week when my special guest will be Dean Henderson discussing the bank stents, which are really gangsters, I guess. But stay tuned for the awesome duo and show, Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mecky coming up next, of course, to sail you on into the night. And we do have a few minutes left here, Joanne. We're getting ready to bail out of here real quick. But what can you tell me real quick about the Philadelphia experiment? Oh, well, there was more to it than just the ships going in and out of the dock. Um, That was Tesla technology that was being used. I know one of... And Mark's dad was involved with one of the experiments. There was a sub that was using some of his technology that went over to Japan and destroyed a Japanese warship right in its harbor, snuck right in. A couple of the incidences happened, you know, the the famous ones that we hear about. Another part of it was that the technology was put on the USS Iowa that took FDR to his meeting with Stalin and stuff, and 
there was a ship there. They knew there was a torpedo going to hit the ship, or you know, it was go anyway. So they used the technology to like phase out the ship. The torpedo passed right through, and they were safe. The other thing is, one of the times, because um, this is going to open up the other other topics, so you'll have to have me back. I definitely um, will have you back. <laughs> one of the times when this one of the, those are famous ones where you hear about the ships at the Philadelphia docks, when it disappeared, it ended up in the Southwest Desert in 1978, or sometime in the 70s, and Mark and his men were right there waiting for it, and they had to send it back to the past. Wow. That sounds like that, uh, sounds like Close Encounters, huh? I know. It's like, oh my gosh, your life is just like Star Trek or Star Wars. or. Well, know. isn't that where Steven Spielberg gets all his information, really, from classified data? <laughs> a lot of them do. And a lot of them, you know, they're well-known. They were friends with the Star Trek people, Roddenberry and stuff. So they were constantly feeding information to the filmmakers and the TV show people. And they were, you know, good friends with Howard Hughes and and stuff. So, yeah, the that's how they get all this stuff. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. People are going to react. You know, how much can the public take? Well, unfortunately, had they been told the truth since, since the beginning, I think we would have been okay. It's The problem is there's been, you know, there's been too much deception since they were children, everybody growing up. And, you know, had right. people just been exposed to the truth, you I mean, you grow up with information that's correct, you're not going to question anything, and you just evolve. But unfortunately, they've lied to, to everybody, and that's too bad. Right, and and then you'd have all these major religions just crumble and fall apart. So, mm-hmm. oh yeah, there's no more control and manipulation based on false realities. Yeah, that shatters their bubble. You know, they can't handle that. I think it's collapsing now. No, I see that happening across the globe. Isn't that what you see, or no? Um, I haven't really noticed, but you know, the the cool thing that I've learned from all this is that all those church leaders know about all this stuff anyway, mm-hmm. because the Vatican has been helping the military with the debris they've been finding. The Mormon Church was helping the military. You know, it's like, oh, really? I was a Mormon for a long time. They didn't preach that from the pulpit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, That's like, interesting, oh, isn't it? But I never knew. <sighs> but this is so much more fun. <laughs> yeah, well, you're knowing a lot now. You're on fast track right now. Well, thank you, Joanne, so much for being here tonight. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I'll see you next week and have a safe weekend. Thank you, Yay. everybody, in the chat room, too. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.